what the warrants have done is is something remarkable that it uh, unbelievable unless you are involved with the war amps. Well, World War I members of the association, um, they were the ones that started the association in 1920. In those days, there was no Medicare, you know, and uh, so it was important that we could assist these people, and gradually we, we, we did, and uh, it's just become bigger and bigger, and more recognized by the public, more appreciated by the public, and it's very rewarding to see the results. Yes, yeah, very rewarding. The war amps are the biggest part of my life, and I, I love the whole darn thing. Fighting men, every one of them, imbued with the Canadian Army's spirit of attack. Well, I signed up because I was asked to. We were just given notice to to uh, report to, to Fredericton. It was the Depression. Uh, you didn't have a great opportunity to travel, so the thought of getting on a ship and going overseas, and wow, that was great. So I walked up Randall Street, Vancouver, and the sign was up there, recruiting. So, and I don't know, I just walked up the stairs, and the next thing I know, I'm walking back down the stairs with a uniform on. On December 17, 1939, the first Canadians landed in Britain, vanguard of a great army. They came the to first thing is the basic home. training where they teach you to how to march and uh, pay attention, do, do what you, they tell you to do so you don't get into trouble. <laughs> I decided that I would be a gunner because I wanted to get overseas before the war was over and that was the shortest course. They put us on a train for Halifax, a few days there. So we stepped right off the troop train right into the Queen Mary. It was just unbelievable. We had um, two meals a day. You could only stay in your zone. There were so many. <laughs> I slept in a lifeboat. We just landed in northern England, and then they took us a train down to Aldershot. We did basic training there, and a lot of extensive training with tanks and so forth, and well, you firing guns and stuff. You've got to be tough to take the new kind of war, and one of the jobs of the battle wing at CTS is to make the Canadian Army that way. The obstacle course... We were field engineers. Uh, that was really what we considered our major function, was building ba Bailey Bridges. We were traveling in jeeps. It was nice. You draw to the village. People came out, nice ladies came out with flowers, with wine, so we enjoyed it. It was good. Occasionally, we were stopped by Germans, either it was a bridge or something, so we had to fight to get over the river or whatever it was. The takeoff light is flashed at the bomber in the queue, and away into the night roars Queenie. When you're in the air and you look down, it's black, so it's hard to, to identify. But when you're looking up against the clear sky, you're very, very visible. We, we didn't see them, and the first thing we knew, we were blown out of the sky. They they're, they're were shelling the hell out of us. Seen my guys being shot. The bullets were going like bzim, 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 bzim. That's when I was wounded. All I could see was this. Hanging, hanging down. It was all black, black, blue, and, uh, and I jumped and I hit the bank and fell backwards. And I guess an arm flopped and hit the front of the train. And when I woke up, I had one arm. So we started back. We almost got to the other 
bridge and I stepped on the landmine and that was it. Another shell landed and three more of my buddies were running for cover to come into that irrigation trench. And it landed, it killed them. I was standing in front of my office and I had my arm on him like that and the shell came between and took my arm off. I knew I was hit, but I didn't know how bad. And uh, I used my parachute and uh, I landed in a, in a grain field in, in France. I had an opportunity to uh, undo my flying pants and look at my leg and, and I knew that I wasn't going to go anywhere. And it didn't take long for a farmer and his wife to come out and find me. And when I woke up, the doctor was there and he, he said, we had to remove your leg. So that was the end of my army venture. The war amputees are experienced in the trauma of limb loss. They have had many years of learning to adjust to day-to-day -day living with an artificial limb. Today, they are a viable, cohesive organization that grew out of the need for a united effort to solve the unique problems of limbless ex-servicemen. It's funny to say, but I'm proud to be an ant. Look at the organization I belong to. On a kind of war. Good came out of the war. We help people, help children. The War Amps Association, uh, and, and especially the, the key tag operation, we were always attempting to do something that would keep us independent. We, were, we didn't want to beg anybody for anything. We wanted to be able to do what we could ourselves. It's amazing how many, uh, how far they've come since we first joined until now. You know, and, and all the people they've helped and everything. The CHAMP program is one of the great things that has ever been thought of as far as human beings are concerned. Yeah, it really is. And it's just amazing all the things that they do for the champs and how the children come together like they seem to just fit in. We exist because of champs. There's only a few of us uh, left. So, but uh, I think the name, the names of war amp has to be. We survive through the key tag service. And so I'm very proud of that because we all benefit. We're helping child amputees. Nobody, there, who would be helping child amputees before we come along? Who would be helping them? It makes me feel proud and great. It makes me feel like I've been doing something. But I'll keep on too as long as I can. You'll see coming in another celebration cake that was prepared in our honor and the honor of our 95th anniversary. And during the day, we've heard a lot about our 95th anniversary. And